Welcome to T-Bone Speaks with Dr. Tarun Agarwal, where our goal is to change the way you practice dentistry by helping you achieve clinical, financial, and personal balance. Now, here's your host, T-Bone. All right, everybody, welcome back. Today we have a wonderful guest. He is, well, I knew him initially as the skiing dentist, but now I know him as Dr. Wade Pilling, who is in Boise, Idaho, who graduated 2005 from uh, Louisville, Kentucky, dental school at least. I thought personally the way he acts, I thought maybe he'd got his uh, degree online from Surfer Institute or something. But uh, Wade, how are we doing? I'm doing great. You said that Boise is not very nice right now. It's hot. Oh, well, it's I love it when it's hot. You get out the boat and go surfing. You go surfing whether it's on water or ice, isn't it? Or oh, snow. yeah. Yeah, we've got a boat that creates a really nice wave, and you just get behind it, and you, you surf on it. It's a blast. And you can still stand up? Yep. Do you need help getting up now? No. You can use a rope to get up, or you can just jump off the back of the boat while the wave is there and land in it. And stand while you land? Yeah. Dude. <laughs> okay. It's well, fun. I, li- I like to surf, and when you don't live in the ocean, you got to find a way to do it in the mountains. And you, so there's a lake close by? Yeah. Yep. How far away? Uh, about 20 minutes from my house. Oh, that's nothing. Yeah. So we can jump up after work or, you know, weekends. Good for you, man. I'm too lazy to do any of that stuff. My body shows it, though. Yeah, I got six kids, and so I got to stay young and active, keep up with them. Yeah, I was just going to teach mine to be slow like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a better long-term investment right there. Yeah, it is. It is. So, uh, that, you know, I, I, that it works very good for me right now. Well, Wade, yeah. you know, I wanted to bring you on because uh, one of the things is that nowadays there's so many, not forums, but groups on Facebook and uh, they're popping up all over the place. And one of the ones that we've had healthy discussions in is the dental investment group. Uh, which is a group for dentists that want to discuss investments. And you seem to kind of know what you're talking about there. Well, I, I've had some experience. You know, I consider myself uh, an entrepreneur. I like to seek out and grow businesses and, you know, do things in that way. So I've dabbled in it quite a bit to where I've made enough mistakes that hopefully I've, I've learned a little. Well, with mistakes also come some wins too. So hopefully we, we've won enough along the way. Yes. Yes. So, so talk to me about this. When you say that you're like you're, that you're an entrepreneur, what what does that mean to you? And and tell me more about that. Well, I like running multiple businesses. I like seeing a business grow. I like seeing employees thrive and grow. There's just something about creating that I enjoy. And so, what kind of businesses are you running right now? Well, obviously, my dental office, which is the cash creator to be able to do these other things. Absolutely. People all often ask me, you know, how do you fund some of these other businesses and how do you do it? And really it comes down, your machine has got to be your dental office. You need to focus on your dentistry first. And once you create a machine in your office that's able to produce enough income, then you can start going out and doing everything. But every, we should always, as dentists, view our practice as our primary source of income, at least at the beginning, and focus on that before we start going into other things. I would add one more thing to that. I would say that we also have to learn not to overspend as we increase our income and our practices so that we do have the freedom and flexibility that our income affords us. And that's very hard. And that, that takes discipline. And that's, that is hard to do. I think discipline is probably the key word. That's the word that's so hard for any human being to really have. But anyway, I interrupted you. So obviously you have your dental practice. What else do you have going on? So I started with my dental practice, then I delved into real estate, building uh, residential homes, commercial properties, and then I got into doing that property management, some of those. Then I started building hotels, Marriott Hotels, with a group of us. We got into the business and started uh, developing and opening Are you hotels. About Indian? <laughs> no, no. No, I'm not from the reservation. No, no, I'm talking about Dot, not I, Feather, dude. <laughs> no, no, no. I get it. I'm joking. Yep. No, not the Dot Indian. <laughs> but yeah, I know I know they kind of do that kind of stuff. They band together as a family and group, and they do a really good job of, of, of developing and investing and doing that kind of stuff. But no, got in hotels, and then from there, it's uh, expanded other things. Car wash, the automated car wash industry has been good, and so we've 
gotten into that. Even kind of taught my my kids a little bit, and I started a business with my son that has done really well. How old is your son? He's 15. Okay. That's awesome. He's going to own a business at 15? He actually started it at age 13. What, he is, what did he start? So he started a company called Bubble Soccer Idaho, where he purchased these inflatable bubble balls that people get in and play full contact soccer with. And he rents them out to businesses, events, family reunions, house parties, you name it. And he started a website, didn't even have a cell phone, and started a business. He's not old enough to have a cell phone in the Wade Pilling house. <laughs> Nope. But you can own a business. <laughs> yeah, to start a website, open a Gmail account. And, you know, he was making close to 30 grand first few years doing it. He actually had some employees that would drive and deliver and rent he out. He drive. <laughs> yep. He just got his driver's license. So now he gets to drive. And so he still runs it. And, you know, it was enjoyable for me to watch him take just a small capital investment, you know, that I lent him. And he, he paid me back with interest. What? And what kind of dad are you? <laughs> he actually stores the equipment in my barn and I charge him rent each month to store it in there. He's got to learn that. He's got to learn. There's no free rides. Good for you. So talk own. to me about this home building. Are you still in that? I do. I still build uh, some homes, some spec homes occasionally. I don't do it as much anymore as the hotel industry has got a lot better return for me. The Marriott's have a better return. And a when you say more Marriott, what, which, which flags are you building? Like the real Marriott Red? Yeah, so we'll do we'll do Marriott Fairfield Inns, okay. Courtyards, Residence Inn, and Spring Hill Suites. So those are the ones we've kind of gone into. Have you done anywhere you build like two or three different ones on the same area? So two of our locations in the group actually are right next to each other. For example, we just – two years ago, we built a hotel in – Twin Falls, Idaho, a Fairfield Inn, and it was doing probably in the top 5% of the nation for this brand of hotel. It was doing so well that we're actually on the other end of the parking lot putting another one in, but a different flag. Yeah, you have to have another uh, flag. Yeah, it's just we knew if someone else was coming in, going to come in, we, we might as well compete with ourselves. So we're in the process of putting another one up there. So yeah, we've done that where we've shared space, you know, what parking. Are you put in the courtyard? Uh, I think we're going to do a Spring Hill Suites. Okay. That's good. That's awesome. So back to the residential homes. Uh, at your peak, how many of these houses were you building? Gosh, not a lot. I mean, we would do maybe two or three a year. Some of the homes were larger. Like, you know, we've had seven, 8,000 square foot homes, spec homes. So they were kind of bigger, kind of all in, not the small, typical white flip ones. Okay. Were but, you doing these alone as your own business or were you in a partnership with somebody? Depends on the home. Some of them I did by myself. Uh, some of them I did. So with you a were the general contractor. Yeah, in a little bit of a way. I still had a, a guy who a foreman that okay. I would hire to do a lot of it. So I could general contract a lot of it myself and just pay the foreman. And really, the foreman was doing most of the work anyway. Yeah, that's awesome. And the commercial buildings uh, aren't as good as the hotels. You mean the residential buildings? No, the commercial buildings. Oh, no, our commercial buildings have been really good, but the hotels have just been – they've just been a really good return. And the reason I'm starting to do more of the hotels is our group, you know, we have a little bit of a long-term plan to be bought out by some venture capitalists. And so same with the car washes. You know, our goal is to build enough of a portfolio that private equity comes in and buys us out. So it's okay. not just flipping a hotel. We're trying to build an empire that will eventually have a big and, windfall. And down. if you don't mind telling the listeners, how big of an empire does one have to have before venture capital is even interested? Oh, it depends. I mean, we've we've already had, after a couple locations, had venture capital come in and, and offer. But we turned them down because we're hoping to build more. I mean, the, the group we have – in the portfolio right now, about 10 hotels. And so that's, I would think after five is when you start getting, you know, uh, people knocking on the door asking, hey, are you willing to sell? Interesting. Because we're building our 10th hotel right now. At some point, I'd like to sell too. You're building? Yeah, yeah. My dad and I are building our 10th. We're building a Holiday Inn. So we have a, we have a few mom and pops and the rest are different flags. But Yeah, uh, we, there's, a, there's a Holiday Inn Express in our group. Yeah, so we have uh, two Holiday Inn Expresses, and now we're building, I call it the green, but Holiday Inn green. So uh, <laughs> so we're required to have a restaurant and stuff in this one. So Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the Express flags weren't available, and we didn't want to try some of the new products. 
So we just went with uh, the traditional green, uh, but it'll, they'll do fine. I mean, yeah, the hotels have been great. Just depends on the location, but I mean, they I, can suffer too. I, I mean, we've had some that haven't been so great. Yeah, we've seen about 25% return, 20 to 25% return a year, but we've been in some really good markets right now and in some really, really hot areas. And we got in on some of the ground, the dirt pretty cheap. So we were able to get in with pretty low debt. Um, but no, they've been great. I, I love the travel perks with Marriott. One of the reasons we, we stayed with Marriott is they're a brand that's about 65% corporate business. And so they don't have the huge fluctuations with tourism and economies. And some of the locations we built, I mean, we had signed big corporate contracts with big factories and companies locally that would use it a lot. And so we had we had contracts signed before we even broke ground, knowing we would have some pretty good guaranteed business. How'd you get into the hotel business? Through a friend of a friend of a brother of a, a relative, you know, you get in contact. I think when you're a dentist, you tend to be a target for a lot of people. So it seems so like you people that's are, a target, not in a good way. Yeah, exactly. So you, you're always having people looking at contacting you, trying to get you to invest. And this, and most of them are, I think you're a target, you're getting the shaft. And so, but you know, you can sift through them and find the ones that are good. And this was a situation where I was contacted through someone who was a relative of my brother on another side of a friend, you know, distant. And I looked at the scenario and it, it made sense. Did you sense. realize what you just said to me, Wade? Somebody that was a relative of your brother. I mean, would that not be your relative? Well, it was through his wife's <laughs> father's, you know, step wife, you know, something like that. So I'm a listener and I, I make good money and I'm not as entrepreneurially spirited as you. How do I sift between being a target as a vulture or having an opportunity that makes sense? Well, that's that's really what it's all about, and and it's very hard because you know I'm not an expert in the hotel industry. I really am not. I rely on the reports and advice of other people who may have ulterior motives. So it's really hard for you to be as knowledgeable as maybe the people you're investing with. So for me, it has to go with the person you're investing with. I had to know I could trust them. Um, you know, they know I know where they live. They know I, I know them personally. I can go see them. Um, it's not someone who's faceless, you know, or the phone. Um, and you have to just trust them. You have to go off your gut. And on top of that, some things to watch out for is, you know, why do they need your money? You know, if if they're running such a successful business, why do they need your money in the first place? And if they do, what kind of value are they giving you? I find a lot of times you're con when you're contacted for investments, you know, they want you to bring the money to the table and they're bringing the operations. They're the hands-on guy and that's their goodwill. And and, you know, people like to value their goodwill a lot higher than it actually is. Oh, no, the money, and the money is king. Cash is king. So people will always come to you the deal and they'll value their goodwill way higher than it should be. Um, and that's understandable. You do the same thing with your dental practice when you go to sell it. You know, you think it's worth more than it is. And so you just have to sift through and say, okay – cash is king you have if they're coming after they want your money you have a position negotiation and you know you can value their goodwill lower than they do and you just have to be able to aware and know when someone's well at the end of the day know, you become a bank right and you have to look at it the same way a bank would and if a absolutely. bank is unwilling to give them money there's there's usually a good reason that they're generally speaking unwilling to give them money yeah, and some of these deals may be, you know, I mean, we've had deals, $50 million building hotels, you know, and so when you're dealing with large amounts of money, sometimes it's nice to bring on an attorney. I mean, it's worth the money to pay for an attorney to look, to do credit checks, to look at assets, you know, to evaluate, evaluate it just like a banquet, just so you know what you're getting into. Okay. I mean, because because we're dentists, we can't we can't read you know contracts and understand the ins and outs of everything. We we, we really do have to rely on the advice. Of Unless the contracts have MOD filling, you have no idea what it says. Yes. <laughs> so wait, are you still a practicing dentist? I am. Dentistry is still my you know main engine, my practice, uh, my income. I enjoy it. Um, you know, I've, I've I've thought about getting out of it someday. I I've gone from multiple practices down to just one practice, and now brought in a partner. You know, so that I can slowly kind of phase out. But I still enjoy it. Let's talk about that a little bit. So so you you got out of school and you started your own practice. Yes. And then how did you get to multiple practices? 
Well, there, there were just opportunities that arose where one was uh, a doctor was moving out of a building uh, into a new building, and so his space was available. And I picked up the phone one night, and when I heard about it, and talked to a friend of mine, said, "Hey, let's do a little scratch start satellite office, both of us." And we did it that night. Just decided to do it, and then, you know, so we started a scratch start while we were both doing our regular startups. You know, and then another opportunity, someone was trying to sell and I had a brother who was coming into practice with me. And so we bought that one to give him some work to do. And so I just kind of keep my ear to the ground. And when opportunities arose, I tried to pounce on them. At one point, how many practices did you have? Uh, we just got up to three. Okay. And then at that point, I just, I didn't enjoy multiple practices. It was just, it just wasn't my style. I'm not one of those big managers. You know, I'm not a micromanager. I couldn't. You know, I didn't think I also had the employees to run the practice, you know, with me being absent. So I always felt like I had to be at the practice for it to be successful. And I just didn't like that. And so I, we just slowly found a way to bring my brother in as a partner and sell off the other practices. Okay. So now your brother is your partner? Yes. Okay. And what's that like? You know, it just happened a couple months ago. And uh, I think it's been great. He's so a good you're guy still honeymooning with. with each other? Exactly. <laughs> but he but he's kind of worked with me for, you know, quite a while. And so, you know, we're completely different personalities, but I think it works. You know, Thank we God. Play. Yeah. I mean, when you get to practice with your brother and you get along, so I can't, I can't see a, a better opportunity than that. Okay. All right. So would you say that um, life is better with one practice? Are you more profitable with one versus three? Yeah, I am. I believe so because I've used that extra time that I was spending managing other practices, you know, doing these other businesses and investments. And those are more passive investments for you, correct? Yeah. There's a lot of legwork up front, you know, like, you know, we're doing this, uh, we've been doing car washes and that takes a lot more work up front with the real estate side and I get somewhat involved with. But once they're set up, they're kind of, they're really just passive. In fact, all of my hotels and car wash, I have, I don't even have operational control of them. You know, I'm not a manager of them. So, so you're a silent investor in a way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have operational control under certain circumstances if stuff happens. Yeah. You have, you have authority, but you don't, you're not in a day to day operation nope. of it. Not once. In fact, if I show up at the hotel, the GM might know who I am. And that's about it. That's awesome. Yeah. I need it. I, I like it. It's passive. I just open up the mail once in a while and cash a check. So, but you have to put your income, you have to put your money up to be able to do that. Absolutely. None of these investments I do borrowing money. I, I want to do them all cash. That's good. Good, 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 good. So and, real quick, and, that's, and that's why you need your practice to be an engine, a machine that's, you know. So let's, let's switch to that a little bit. Let's talk about how, how have you created your practice as, I love how you call it an engine. That's interesting. So talk to me about how, how have you driven your practice to be an engine? Oh, gosh. It's been, it, it took a lot of investment. You know, I did a scratch startup in 2005, six, you know, right when the economy was about to crash, you know, and uh, I was a couple million dollars in debt. I built a 9,000 square foot building with a big, beautiful office, you know, with no patients. You, so, your office is 9,000 square feet? Well, I, I built half of it for my office. Okay. So about 4,500 for my office and the other half was I'm going to rent it out to someone and they're going to pay my rent. They're going to pay my mortgage, you know, type of thing. But it sat empty for six years because oh the, oh. the economy crashed. And I had millions of dollars in debt. You know, I built a Taj Mahal office, you know, whether that was a good or bad thing, I don't know. But I built a nice office, lots of nice equipment. And at that point, I still invested in my continued education. I made sure I went and learned how to do the type of procedures I wanted to do. And that how long took a before lot of you were profitable? I think I was profitable the first year. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's I was in a growing area at least. And so it wasn't – we weren't hit too hard by the economy. But – I was in a growing area, but I spent a lot of time and money going away to, you know, the Hornbrook Group's courses, Spears courses, other things in order to, you know, be the kind of dance I wanted to be. But I, I wanted to say that you wanted to be, that you needed to be. Yeah, that's true. I built my life and my, my practice and my style around catering to a certain type of patient, and, and that's what I was going to do, and it paid off, and it's it's done well for us. I'm glad that we did it. Do you take insurance? I do. Like you're in network? 
yeah. So I'm in network for a lot, but the bulk of my practice, you know, is cosmetic, reconstructive, implant, stuff that really isn't covered by insurance anyway. And so I'm a lot of my dentistry is not insurance based, even though I am in network. I am also in Idaho where my overhead, I can keep my overhead low. My labor is pretty affordable. Cost of everything else is pretty affordable. So for us, taking PPOs isn't a huge write off. Yeah. How did you develop a practice doing cosmetics and implants and things like that in a PPO environment? Well, I, I guess because I, most people will tell you, I mean, I won't tell you that it's not possible because I, we've done the same thing, but most people will tell you that's not possible. Oh, it's absolutely possible. Like I said, so much of it is not insurance based. It's elected dentistry. You know, I'm in a state where if insurance isn't covering something, I get my full fee, you know, and or you find a way to get your full fee by making sure you charge for every single thing you do. You know, you don't just hand stuff out for free. But I, I guess I view my practice as kind of two doors. I've got an aesthetic side of my practice and I have my general dentistry side of my practice. And and so I, I really just view it as almost two separate practices in one. Okay. Well, we're very similar weight in those things. So tell me this. How are you marketing your – let's just forget about the general dentistry side. I, I don't care about that. <laughs> How are you marketing your cosmetic and implant side? You know, a lot of it's just word of mouth. But I have dabbled in radio, I'm in radio and direct mail marketing, some magazines, more some branding things. But I honestly haven't done a ton of marketing other than just, you know, some radio, which I typically do for – product specific things, you know, whether it's orthodontics or, or implants. And so you're not doing any paper clicks, Facebook ads, things like that? No Facebook ads. No, I do a little bit of Google paper click, or I don't know what it is, Google AdWords or something, yeah. but I only do a tiny bit of it because somehow I feel that if you're not doing it, they're probably not going to rank your organic stuff very high. I know they're, it's not supposed to be the case with them, but I just have a feeling if I do a little bit of organic with them then the, or inorganic pay per click or whatever that I'll rank a little bit higher in the organic stuff. That's interesting. All right. So now let's talk about okay so so I know I know what the typical listeners thinking dude I'm never going to buy car washes I don't wash my car to begin with I'm never going to do hotels because I'm white and not Indian you know, I'm, I'm never going to build houses because for God's sakes I, I don't I didn't like building my own house so why in the hell am I going to build houses for other people so let's turn to like what every dentist can do and that's like basically invest in, in stocks or mutual funds or something along those lines. So what advice or what, where are you at with things like that? Well, I would say that should be your primary. I don't invest in, in hotels, car washes, homes or anything until I've fully funded my 401k and my uh, – just my strict you know, Vanguard index funds marketing accounts. You know, I, I have my goals of which I want to meet in those. So those are met first before I do these other – So you have, a, you have a monthly bill basically. Yeah. So every month, X amount goes into my 401k, X amount goes into into just my straight investing account. So that's just that just goes without saying. And then if there's left over, I search, you know, for these other options. But I would say for any, you know, you know, with dentistry, you've got to invest. I mean, I mean, we make a good we make a good income, but we if spend you want, it. we spend it. Yeah, yeah. And if you have it on autopilot, and it's just gone it's out of the account out of sight out of mind you're probably not going to spend it as much yeah, you so <laughs> yeah you can so, that was the best thing i ever did in my life was put it on autopilot man and i yeah. have a formula where i increase it every every year i increase it a certain a certain dollar amount and and I, I haven't looked at it i mean you know from the sense of that it's going out of my account yeah and i'm and i'm glad i i do that over and above some of the other things but no I, like i'll do the 401k my wife i have as an employee at the office she gets a part of, participate in the 401k i've got these kids and they're all employed under some of my enterprises of all my different businesses they're all employed so they all get paid something to consider is if you have kids your first six thousand dollars you pay them is tax-free they don't pay any taxes and no that payroll taxes, the ira nothing. or something and then you stick all of that into a Roth. Before you know it, your kids are, you know, set well, for life. Think about that. When when can they start that? Age six, seven, I think. Oh gosh, I always joke. I tell them you can start them in the womb. Okay. So <laughs> let's take let's, let's say you start them at age five, and so by the time they get eighteen, that's thirteen years. I mean, you're talking about having a couple of hundred grand already. Oh yeah, and that they can take that out for their education, or you can just leave it there for. And that's all tax free money. Absolutely. 
yeah, you can always find something for your kids to do. I mean, your five-year-old can shred paper for you. I mean, she can feed paper into the shredder for you if you're shredding documents and stuff. I mean, there's you, – you talk to your accountant. There's certainly – work that you can find for your kids to do but so, yeah i would i would encourage the dentist certainly to get get strong and get invested in the market quick and early and set it and forget it so do you do you recommend for people to invest themselves or to work with the money manager or what, what do you recommend I, I do i don't see the value in a money manager other than maybe if you're paying them a fee once in a while to bounce ideas off of them or to you know have them do some calculations for you i think the bulk of of investing can be pretty straightforward it's intimidating because all the marketing out there and all the gurus online make it sound intimidating so that you have to use their services and sometimes you do and sometimes it's advantageous but i think for the most part most people can set it up and do a lot of it themselves obviously a 401k requires some administrative work uh yeah, but, but just if, companies like e-trade and these places make it so easy for you these days yeah i just open a vanguard account and i just put my money in there and it's really straightforward you read a, a, a couple books watch a couple webinars on how to do it yourself and and it actually clicks real fast and do you, you have realize any, uh, suggestions for books yeah let me let me think about that there's i know there's there's some that I can't pull them off the top of my head right now, but I know there's there's one that's really good. It's like the last book. It's like the biggest basic book. I don't know. I'll think about it. It'll come to me in just a second. I'm okay, sure. no problem. So as we keep going here. Okay. So, all right. So you would suggest – what I'm hearing from you is you would suggest that most people don't necessarily need a money manager if they're disciplined on their own. And it sounds like you want them to – you suggest they put their money in either mutual funds or index funds of some sort. Yeah, I think an index fund is going to be your best option. I think it's 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 the best set and forget it, simple, low cost, and actually usually the highest profit yield option you can do. Yeah, I mean most most money managers don't beat the index funds over time. Nope, nope. And and like I said, a money manager has its place if you're, you know, wanting to shoot some advice off them or or whatnot or or do some, you know, evaluations for you on some things you're thinking about doing, but. But I think when it comes to just investing in the market, you really – everyone should be doing it themselves. What's your take on paying off debt early? OK. That's that's an interesting topic and, and I don't, I'm not going to say I'm right here. But I will tell you in my experience, debt has fueled my wealth and success, hands down. Um, I agree Is that paying, student debt? I haven't paid off my student loan debt. But I'm consolidated. Okay, so wait, wait. So, so let me understand this, okay? So you graduated, and I'm not making fun. I'm just making my point, okay? You graduated in 2005. Yes. So that's let's call that 12 years ago. How much were you in debt? Oh, student probably loans. about 180,000. So let's call it 200 grand student loans 12 years ago. So the equivalent of 300 grand today. And 12 years later, you still have not paid it off, but you're amassing a practice, and other ventures that if you had taken time to pay off your debt may not have happened. Exactly. So, But I was consolidated at less than 1%, I think, on my but student loan. But even then, loan, I mean, so. still, there's, there's this mentality that regardless of the interest rate, people just want to be debt-free. And that is good for someone that doesn't handle debt well. If, they don't, if you don't handle debt well and it just keeps you up at night. How do you live in this country and not handle debt well? Exactly. I think I think when you learn to just I mean, I always had in my mind, worst case scenario, if everything goes to crap and I lose everything because of this debt I'm taking on, I can just declare bankruptcy and the next year I have a skill set that can get me two hundred grand a year easy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I looked at it as if worst case scenario, just everything fell apart and the whole country fell Dude, apart. Dude, you still live whatever. a great life. I still live a great life. I could, I could, I have a skill set. That Quite frankly, command. you're probably living on that much money as it is. It sounds like. Yeah, and you could command a salary, you know, the next year. So I looked at the debt as the downside. As, as wasn't that bad. So I would refinance my whenever an, an interest rate came that was better. I would refinance my practice loan to get it lower, and it would refinance it out further even. So I could increase could my cash, cash out. flow. So I yeah, or I could or I could increase my cash flow to go do other ventures to to invest and so i i was not debt adverse at all so you've leveraged your earning power absolutely 
And would you advise – what what percentage – do you think, generally speaking, dentists are too averse to debt? Yeah, I think they are. And, and that's why they're afraid to leverage those things. Do you they, think that's why most dentists can't retire within the 65? Well, that and they spend too much. How do, how? Okay, let's talk about that real quick. How have you avoided spending too much? Or are you just making that much money that you can do everything? A little – well – I don't want to necessarily say that, but I, I'm not the type that wanted to like live on bare minimum and then just retire so I could have a good retirement. I wanted it both. So that's why I've grown these passive incomes so that I can spend more. I just needed an income that would keep up with my spending habits. And your practice wasn't enough? No, I don't think it was. Okay. That's fair. No, so, so I, I don't think so it was. So you haven't alone. been disciplined in a way? No, I haven't been disciplined. Be- well, I've been disciplined in other ways so I didn't have to be as disciplined in my spending Do you drive habits. fancy cars? You know, I don't. Do I don't. you live in a massive home? It's possible. <laughs> De- <laughs> define, define massive. 10,000 square feet plus? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. Did you have that five years out of school? No. Okay. No. No. Why, I, why, I let me ask you this. Why, why are you sensitive about that? About the size of my home? No, just just the success. Oh, I don't think I'm that apprehensive about it, but you know, I just you know, I don't want to come off a certain way. But I don't think you're coming yeah. off that way. What I've what what I see of you, and I wouldn't say we've met a couple of times. I wouldn't say I know you all that well. What I hear from here about you is that you've been disciplined, even though you say you're not, because you save on a regular basis. You pay your freedom fund first. And then you take your extra money and before you blow it, you, you invest it into creating passive income that allows you to blow it too at the same time. So, I mean, yeah, I yeah, mean, I, I, I guess it depends how you're disciplined. I mean, I don't drive a super fancy car. I mean, I, I drive a truck because I like a truck, but I also have a fancy boat. I, you know, I've got a 12,000 square foot home. Um, you know, I, but I have six kids, so I need the space, right? <laughs> right, because because nobody <laughs> because each kid needs two thousand square feet. <laughs> I make my all my girls share a room. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> and you charge your kids rent. Do you charge them rent for living at your house? <laughs> no, but I remind them that I can all the time. <laughs> but but no, I I was disciplined in that I you know I did save. And then, but, but my practice was very successful. I mean, it made more money than I could really spend, you know, at least my lifestyle and, and what I like to spend. My practice was making more than I could spend. What, 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 okay. Than, so let's, let's, I want to come back to that because it's still the engine. Okay. What allowed your practice to be so successful? What did you do? Was it luck? Was it you? What, what was it? I would say a combination of both. I mean, I think it's luck, you know, uh, you know, in the right place, but you know, I was not a bread and butter dentistry. I was, I would see comprehensive patients and, you know, doing large case dentistry. And I just built kind of a reputation with my patients. So I, you know, and they would send me patients and I don't know, my, I think my personality with my patients is they really understood that they had confidence in me, but they really understood that I was there to help them. I'm, I've never been a salesman. I never convince anyone. I, talk more patients out of dentistry. Uh, it's or Maybe it's reverse psychology, but I, I honestly let my patients know, you know what, I don't care if you do this or not. I'm here to help you. Here are your options. They never felt pressured, so it was easy to get a lot of high acceptance for larger cases. It seemed like the less I wanted to treat them, the more they wanted to do. It's interesting. So have you taken any training on patient communication and things like that? None. None. It, it's, just, it's just more my personality of I, I get along with my patients. They trust me. And they know I'm their advocate. My, you know, my biggest thing is always, you know, I why let my patients know, hey, I'm your advocate here to get you where you want to be. Where do you want to be? You know, and so that my patients never feel like I'm trying to push them into something. They're, I'm not trying to make them fit in my box. You know, they just tell me what they want and I give it to them. Hmm. Talk to me about your team. Well, that's probably been a big role uh, of a lot of it. I've got a great team. I've got people that connect. How do you hire well. a great team? Do they just show up? No. You know, once you have – some of them came from like I'd have a, a great employee and they would try and recruit their friends or people they knew in other offices who were like them, you know, to come work for us. So I've had a lot of that. How come none of my team members know other de- other dental professionals? I don't understand why why I have to do all the recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I'll tell you, hiring employees has not been a breeze. It's been a struggle my whole career. I've been certainly been through a lot, you know, in, in like assisting positions and things like that. But I know, find you, that are, the closer they are to me, the more I struggle with people. Yeah, that's true. So the clo- you know, like uh, like I get along with front office people a little bit. Well, I tolerate them much better than I tolerate assistants or people that you know in that position because selfishly they interact with me on a day to day basis. <laughs> Yeah. Have you been with associates before? You've been – like had an associate? Yeah. So my brother was an associate for me for you know the last eight years. He's kind of worked a little bit in my office as an associate but like one day a week. Yeah, it's hard to count brothers as an associates to a certain degree. What yeah. about anybody else outside of your brother? Nope. Nope. So let me ask you this. So how are you planning on being able to get out of the office to – fuel some of these other ventures that you want to do? Well, you know, I, I'll work three days a week seeing patients. I found that I can fit my production and see my patient population in about three days. So I'll work three days a week. And then the other days I'll spend, you know, managing other stuff. I do I do a few other things. I do some speaking, lecturing. I do some consulting work. And Talk so to us I about do, that. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I do some practice coaching for doctors who will bring me into their office and I'll evaluate and I'll kind of coach the doctors on how to handle certain situations, certain cases. A lot of it's clinical too, helping them clinically get better, up to speed, setting up some systems. So I do a little bit of practice coaching. I do some consulting for uh, Wall Street for some private equity groups. So when private equity groups are looking at buying up dental industry companies, products or investing or buying practices, they'll kind of contact me uh, as part of their research. How'd you get and, in that game? Oh gosh. I, uh, I was contacted quite a while ago, maybe f- four or five years ago, about doing it for them. And I have just been doing it for this research company off and on. And they, they'll call me and when they have a project and just kind of hire me by the hour to do that. So and it's been fun. It's been interesting to see kind of that. And then I do some expert witness stuff for the state, for the malpractice insurance. Dude, when so do you those, have time to go skiing? <laughs> oh, I make time to go skiing. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll make it. But no, these are these are just kind of other things that kind of take up my other day off. And how much know, speaking are you practice. doing? Not a ton. I, I kind of pick and choose the ones that I like that are in good places. I don't necessarily have a desire to be on a speaking circuit. I You will speak to smaller groups. You know, if, if someone's putting on an education at a ski resort, I'll sign up. To, I'll, I'll agree to it, you know, <laughs> that type of stuff. So if I want you to speak to my group, I have to do it at a ski resort. A ski resort or somewhere fun, you know. My my lab technician and I, are, uh, you know, do some lectures and we'll, we'll we'll combine them with mountain biking or skiing or stuff like that. And so, you know, for me, it's about doing something fun and enjoying. I, I don't really have a desire to be travel and do much speaking. I saw you did an Ironman recently. Um, I I don't do Ironmans. I do Spartan rate races. Oh, that's what whatever. The, I mean, it's all foreign to me. <laughs> so my wife and I are kind of self-proclaimed semi-pro Spartan racers and so How do you become we, semi-pro? Just self-proclaim it? <laughs> it? Exactly, that's what I said, self-proclaimed semi-pro. So my wife and I we travel and usually like once a month we'll travel to different sites and do compete in a race, either a Tough Mudder or a Spartan race. They're usually about 12 miles filled with about 30 or so obstacle courses and so we'll we'll usually go about one a month and we'll fly somewhere and make a weekend date out of it and <laughs> run hey baby i think we should do a hot weekend date and go run 12 miles <laughs> through obstacle uh, courses <laughs> through hand grenades <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun where did you well, find this woman at <laughs> oh yeah if you knew my wife she loves it she lives for this stuff she's pretty she's pretty tough and uh so we do that. We train. We got a training facility at the house, and so we do a lot of those obstacles and training, and and it's a fun. It's a blast. We just love to go get dirty, and kill ourselves, and then eat a lot of good food after. I just like a lot of good food after. I think that's my problem. <laughs> that's the best part, huh? Yeah. So, what are your short term goals? Where does Wade Pilling want differently for himself that he's not getting right now? Oh. Well, I want to. I want to be able to step away from my practice more from the yeah. stress of it. And an associate I, would help with that. Well, I, with this partner, with my brother as a partner, that's my hope. You know, I've always managed, done all the managing of the practice, and I, I don't have an office manager. I really do 
you know, maybe don't trust anyone to do that. So I've held a lot of the managing of the office and with a partner, you know, I'm hoping he'll be able to take on a lot more of that. And then I'll be able to really step away from the practice a little bit more from a managerial standpoint, and really just kind of show up and but how do you cases, really replace your income in the practice production wise? By stepping away? Yeah. Well, I think I can, st- I think I still have capacity to be down at three days and still produce the same with more efficient scheduling. Maybe just me not seeing as much of the general dentistry cases, just doing more of the, the larger cases. And so I think with scheduling and case selection, I can keep my production pretty close. Okay. What if you can have it all? You mean with an associate? Yeah. Or a specialist that come in? Yeah. So I've looked into that. I honestly am not that much of an expert on how to make those numbers and everything work, partly because I just don't have a high volume practice. So I always worry about bringing in an associate. How am I going to keep him busy? Let him do the fillings you know? and crowns. Yeah, it's true. But I worry, is that enough to keep them busy? You yes. know, I, I don't do a lot of fillings. I, I honestly don't see a lot of general dentistry patients. I mean, I could go a whole week and not even do a filling. What? I thought I was the only one that could do that. <laughs> I just – I honestly don't see my, – my patient population isn't high carries. So, so you, you've niched yourself out pretty good. I have. I think I, uh, the, my population, they're just – they're good with their hygiene. They're all young, cute women that want veneers is really kind of what it is. And so I don't see a lot of high cavities patients. I mean I, literally I might do two root canals a month in my practice. You know, maybe refer one more out. I just don't see that type of patient base because of the niche being niched out. But that's not necessarily a good thing. I think part of the the reason I've struggled to bring on a partner is I just haven't had the the patient load for him. And so we, my partner actually had purchased an office right around the corner from us, and we're merging them together. Okay. So he's kind of, he's bringing in the patient base for him. Dude, all so this stuff, how- and I have to like get it out of you. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about this merging. How how did that come about? Well, I was I con- was I contacted this doctor about a year ago around the corner from me who was going through a divorce and wanting to sell and you know I'd been working Ambulance him over for chaser. But, yeah. <laughs> so, he's going through divorce, getting needing to sell and I, you know, for a year I'd been working with him until the divorce was finally done and he was able to sell. But our plan was he's right around the corner. He's in a smaller space that's leased. He's got a really strong hygiene base. Um, you know, like in my practice, my hygiene's maybe 10% of my practice, if that. And so for me to have a partner, I needed a stronger hygiene base. And so I worked up, you know, an offer with him and he was ready to sell and we bought him out and merging it, is you know, staying, basically. Is he staying on at all? Nope. Nope, he's gone. And so my brother basically is taking over that patient base and merging him into my building because I have the space. And so, you know, where he's able to come in and be busy right away, not, you know, me having to give up anything for him. Okay. Do you think that dilutes your part of the practice at all? In what way? Like, hey, I want to see him now instead? No, I don't think so. I mean, if we're partners, if I have a patient that wants to see him, I'm happy with that too. Okay. I mean, if he's, I guess I view it as if he's successful, I'm going to be successful too. You right, know, no, 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 absolutely. How old are you, Wade? 39. 39. I don't look like you, and I'm only a couple of years older. You even have more hair than me. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> you have more muscles on your stomach than I have in my whole body. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. Oh, your, well. yours are there. Yours are there. Mine are hidden. Yeah, that's true. I I have them. They're just very hidden. They're hidden. <laughs> Actually, they we'll could be bigger them. than yours. Even they probably are <laughs> to carry me around. I say we got to get you to hit the gym. Well, I have one in the house, so I do hit it a couple of times a week. It's just I nice. hit the refrigerator a lot too. Oh my, yeah, yeah. My that's... vice is ice cream. Yeah, I don't think a day goes by that I don't eat ice cream. Yeah, I don't. I don't think a day goes by that you don't exercise. So that's true. <laughs> there's a. I exercise thing. every day, but I I come home and after a stressful day, and I got some Ben and Jerry's fish food in the fr- freezer, and a couple bites of that, and I'm good. Oh, a couple of bites. There's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's your long term goal? When do you think you're gonna uh, hang up the handpiece? You know, I th- I think within ten years. Um, I have a son who is considering going to dental school. So I might have to stick around a little longer, potentially if he would like to come back and work, take over for me. But, you know, I like in 10 years 
to be done. My goal is in five years to really just work if I want to a little bit, but probably hang it up at 10. All right. So have you put a number to that? Uh, so what you want is financial freedom in five years, correct? Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I feel like I have my financial freedom now. I mean, my passive income, you know, equals what I do for my dentistry really pretty much now. And so I, I feel like I could, but I, what would I do with my life? Go skiing. Go skiing. Did you ever set a number that you wanted to have in the bank before you could, before you could uh, walk away? Yeah. So, and it wasn't necessarily a number. Um, I mean, I felt like I needed to have six million in the bank, you know, for me to walk away at age fifty. But I also looked at it as I wanted passive income coming from businesses. So, re, you know, so it's a monthly income from owning a business, not just saved up. And so I've kind of had to merge those two to make my calculation and my number. And you come up with those numbers yourself or did you hire somebody to help you with that? I came up with it myself. You know, I probably ran through a dozen or so different types of calculators and planners about what you need and what you, you know, in retirement to retire. And I, you know, I felt like five, six million dollars, you know, in the bank account combined with a passive business. Income. A passive income of five hundred thousand dollars a year is enough to retire. I mean, I would think. I would depends. Hope. It depends how much yeah. skiing you do. <laughs> how much skiing? Yes. And the earlier you retire, the more money you need. Quite frankly. Absolutely. When did you start putting these numbers together? When did you start thinking that big picture? Probably about five years into practice, after I had kind of weathered the big debt the big debt undertaking, my office, the, the crash of the market. I had built a spec home, you know, a large spec home. I had bought a lot. We were going to build our own home on. And the house across the street, they had framed it but then abandoned it because they had ran out of money. And so I bought it at like a short sale auction for like nothing and finished it. And I sold it, flipped it, and probably made, I don't know, maybe it was four or $500,000 of profit out of it because it was a big 8,000-square-foot home. And so I had this big chunk of money, and I was like, what do I do? Do I wipe out my debt or do well, I invest? Well, you have to pay long-term, short-term gains on it if you don't reinvest it. Yeah, or do I reinvest it and do it? And so I looked and did all those calculations. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to use this to springboard me into investing more things. So you know, I started put it all in the market and then pulled it to do other investments. But yeah, I was just looked at it from that scenario that I, I kind of had a big windfall from that one, you know, risk I took, and you know, kind of springboarded me into deciding, oh, well, I need to pl start planning. I can't just live off what I'm doing and spending it all. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Wade, do you have any questions for me? No. Well, hmm. Let me think. No, this, not really. This is your opportunity to make fun of me. <laughs> Call me out on something that you disagree with me about. Oh, let me see. You know, I don't. I don't think I come up with anything. I'm not too disagreeable. Yeah. Otherwise, well, maybe I am. I don't know. That's good. But no, but no, I've I've enjoyed all your stuff, and you've done a good job of teaching and you know educating me on a lot of things to yourself. So well, I've enjoyed now, this. Now, now I need to come hang out with you. I'm jealous. Yeah. I mean, I'm jealous. I, I'm very jealous that a white person is entering in the motel business. <laughs> to be quite honest with you, I mean, I'm going to have to come sabotage it or something. <laughs> yeah. You got to leave that for the Indians. Is your, is your guys' end game to get bought out? No. Uh, um, or is this kind of a family legacy thing? You know, it's interesting. I can't describe our end game because really most of it's been driven by my father. And for him, it's all about been that's his sole, sole source of income. Uh, so it's it's been about, you know, being able to put me through dental school, my brother through dental school, you know, some of those things. So that's what's fueled him, certainly. I don't know what fuels him today. I don't know why we're building at age 70-something. He's building another motel, and he tells me he's he thinks he's got another one in him. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, so certainly I invest in those and and, and part of that. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm like you. I'm a very much a passive investor at this stage. I, th I think the time will come that I won't be a passive investor. But the, the challenge will be is do we sell or do we continue to allow it to create income? And, um, you know, I, I don't know how to answer that question, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, our car wash, 
you know, we had two and a half locations, um, one not even third one not even in business, and we had a big national chain come offer us, you know, twenty million dollars to buy us out before we were even none, none of it's been, even been in business more than a year, you know, and so we turned them down to build more, and so there's car washes com- good businesses. Oh, you crazy business! These these are they're the automated tunnels, meaning they can pump a car through every ten seconds. Oh, they're so they're not au- there's not a human being hand drying them. No, this is like – these are the automated brushes, washers, dryers, blowers. People oh, like buy. a gas station kind of thing. Yeah. they're but better. They're better. And they come with vacuums on the outside. So Who does the vacuuming? A robot? You can, no, you do the vacuuming. Oh, I can't, go to, I can't go to those kind of places. Like. <laughs> but this is – these are just tunnels. You drive in them, put your car in neutral and it pulls you through. And it soaps, washes, scrubs, cleans, spits you out the back end. And, and have these big massive dryers, blowers at the end basically? Yeah. Yeah, so you can wash your car pretty good, and people buy monthly memberships to them. So they can go uh, that, so the that there's the model. Yeah, they yeah, buy I did this in dental school. I I think I used it three times the whole damn year. <laughs> yep, we made they made money off you. Yeah, I, I oh. hope they made. They kind of. I still have a gym membership. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I've had a gym membership for fifteen years now. Yeah. But no, you know, they're, they're great money. I mean, you're probably, you might be four and a half million dollars into a location and it'll profit probably a million dollars a year, close to. So 25%. After debt service. Yeah. And so it's even more after you paid off the debt. So they're, they're pretty good. You know, and the hotel guy I went in with, the CEO of our group, he used to work in private equity and he knows what private equity looks for to buy out. So he's like, he wanted to get in at the ground level. So he left private equity and came into starting these on the ground level. And he's just building a portfolio that's, he runs them so lean and mean to make them look so profitable that for the investors, but also for private equity that comes along and will buy you out for, you know, pretty good windfall. And so the both, both those, those types of passive incomes, our end game has been to eventually be bought out. So we'll have to, I'll have to look for something else, you know, to invest in after that. Have you met Depesh? Uh-uh. You need to meet Depesh. He's in the Indianapolis area. He's, he's an Indian that does motels. I think he does dentistry just to buy motels. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gwade, it's been an unbelievable pleasure. Uh, I've learned a lot about you, and I hope our listeners have as well. And, oh, well, thank uh, you. Uh, so I look forward to uh, I, I look forward to seeing you at my next Tough Mudder. <laughs> yes. When, when when will that be? Uh, so it depends when Dairy Queen has one. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I've actually started a, a dental group for Spartan racing. So for dentists who want to go travel around do Spartan races. How many people in your group? I just started it this last week. It was an idea. And this way – you can people can join and go run races, and it can be a business expense because you're going with other dentists, and you can talk about dentistry. I don't know; I haven't figured that part out yet. But I'm sure it's a way. It's more just for a tax, tax turn them into tax write offs. Listen, dude, I I need you to tell me how many people legitimately joined this group with the intention of not just going but participating, like as in like they love to do this. I, I want to yeah. know how many crazy people there are out there. There are. They're great for like team building, you know, bring your staff. You know. <laughs> if I went to, I'm going to go to my office tomorrow and be like, hey, gang, we're going to Cancun to do a tough mutter. <laughs> I bet you, I, I, I'll bet money that half of them will say no. <laughs> yeah. Once you got to get, you got to get people that are just, they're gluttons for punishment. Oh my God. All right. Thank you, Wade. Oh, Wade, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, you can just email me at drwadepilling at yahoo.com or just on Facebook, you know. Wait, send me a message. Do you have an AOL address too? What, what is that? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> the Yahoo one will do. We don't need to embarrass me. For everybody listening, I, I think I want us to take a few very important messages uh, from what Wade's talking about. Uh, I think Wade is uh, – I think the biggest message is do not be debt averse. Uh, there and and there's a big difference in being personal debt in the sense of hey I'm in debt because I buy stupid things versus being in debt to fund uh, passive income and business and enterprising growth and I, I think that's the big difference uh, I don't encourage people to get in debt to buy cars or to buy homes uh, I encourage people to to consider debt to build businesses and expand their business and I think Wade's a great example of that 
And uh, so ultimately, when you do that, you can have those fancy things as well if you want them. So uh, I commend you, Wade, and I hope more people get in touch with you to learn more about how you've done it. And uh, uh, and I hope they find you at a ski resort or a Tough Mudder program along the way. That would be good. Thanks so much for listening to T-Bone Speaks with Dr. Tarun Agarwal. Remember to keep striving for excellence, and we'll catch you on the next episode.